During the Holocaust, the Nazis killed around 12 million people, 6 million of them being Jews. But the Nazis did not get Joseph Weisberg, my grandfather, nor did they get his three sisters, all Holocaust survivors. The story I'm about to tell you is about his life during World War II and afterwards. Stories about survivors have been told, filmed, or documented, and each one is different and deeply personal to those who are responsible for their narrations so that these atrocities will not be forgotten. It is my honor, duty, and privilege as his grandchild to keep his story alive. This is Joseph's story. My great-grandparents, Ida and Israel Weisberg, were born in Poland and moved to France in the 1920s to avoid the pogroms in Poland at this time. They settled in Metz, and their first child was born in 1932, followed by my grandfather, Joe, in 1934, and his sisters, Lena, in 1936, and Sabine, in 1940. Unfortunately, they could not stay in Metz for long, as it was not safe for Jews, and in 1939, they moved to lille de Léron for a few months, and then to saint michel des rivières in the Dordogne area. There, Israel, a tailor, was able to find work and provide for his family. They stayed in saint michel des rivières for two years, and during that time, Joe and his sisters went to school. One day in October of 1942, my great-grandmother, Ida, saw the French police coming to their house and begged her husband, Israel, to take their son and run away. Fully aware of what would happen to the rest of the family if he did so, Israel decided to stay and keep the family together. This was most likely the first decision that saved the lives of his four children. The French police arrested the whole family and placed them, along with many other Jewish families, in a camp that resembled a movie theater in Angoulême. They stayed there for a few months, until one day, someone from an organization called Lozé, which is a French organization dedicated to helping children, came and spoke to many parents. Lozé stated that if parents wanted their children to have a chance at survival, then the children would have to leave with Lozé. After escaping the pogroms of Poland, Ida and Israel knew that they had to let their children go in order for them to survive. It was their only chance and they had to make this decision extremely quickly. I can only imagine what went through their minds while making this unbearable decision. But my great-grandparents decided to save the lives of their children and to let them go. This was the last time my grandfather ever saw his parents. They were sent to Auschwitz where they perished immediately. Their names are engraved outside of the Shoah Memorial in Paris, along with the names of all other French Jews who were sent to camp during the war. My grandfather doesn't remember the tragic separation from his parents, but his older sister Rose remembers that the last thing her mother asked her to do was to keep the family together, which was no easy job for a 10-year-old. The three girls were taken to a religious institute for girls, while my grandfather went to a boys' religious institute. He stayed there for a few months and remembered becoming a choir boy, even though he did not know anything about the songs. His cousin Maurice, who was a pre-med student in the city of Poitiers, came to get the four children and to take them from occupied France to free France, where his parents lived at the time. They went through the demarcation line, in a carriage with a horse in the middle of the night, and got to Poitiers in the middle of a bombarding, and had to hide under a train to avoid being killed. When it became safe again, Maurice took them to his parents, who had a small house right next to the German commandateur. He only stayed with them for a little while, because his aunt and uncle could not take care of four more children. Sabine, who was only two years old, ended up going to another aunt and uncle who eventually adopted her. My grandfather and his two other sisters were brought to the Chateau du Majulier in the Creuse County. This castle was turned into a place for children taken in by Lozé to stay. My grandfather remembers that this was a relatively quiet period in time. He also remembers that there wasn't much to eat. One day, while he was going through the kitchen, he stole a potato that was cooking. When dinner was being served, they noticed that a potato was missing. The director said that nobody could eat until the person who had taken the potato gave his to the child without one and that there would be no consequences. My grandfather, feeling extremely guilty, got up and gave his to the child with the empty plate. The kids stayed in the Chateau du Majulier from the end of 1942 until April of 1944, when the Germans requisitioned the chateau. My grandfather's two sisters left immediately, but he had to stay behind because he had gotten tuberculosis and was not allowed to leave yet. He was one of the last ones to leave the castle and was brought to Lyon by train by Lozé. There, a passeur named Georges Longier helped my grandfather and many other Jews reach a small village near the border of Switzerland named Animas. They stayed there for a few days until they were told that they had to go through the border to Switzerland. That night, as my grandfather prepared to leave with Lozé for Switzerland, he was given a backpack that he had to carry across the border. In this backpack was an infant. My 10-year-old grandfather carried the infant across the border into Switzerland. There were three convoys that night, and my grandfather was in the second. He later learned that of the three convoys, his was the only one to make it across the border. The other two were stopped and everybody was arrested. Once in Switzerland, they went to a refugee camp called the Camp at the End of the World, where they stayed for a few days. This camp had people who were fortunate enough to have escaped France and made it into Switzerland. My grandfather was given 50 cents of Swiss franc from the Swiss authorities. He remembers buying condensed milk for the first time. 
To this day, the taste of condensed milk still represents freedom to him. He then went to live with a family in Zurich, Switzerland who owned a butcher shop. This family didn't treat my grandfather very well, so he left and was taken in by another family. The father of this new family worked for a chocolate factory named Souchard, and my grandfather remembers eating a lot of chocolate during this time. Given the family didn't have any children of their own, they treated him as if he were their son. He stayed with the family from September of 1944 until March of 1946. After the war was over, the family wanted to adopt him. My grandfather was very thankful for everything the family had done, but before being adopted, he wanted to make sure that he did not have any family members that were alive. The Red Cross miraculously helped him find his sisters and his cousin Maurice. He went to live with his aunt back in Metz. He then started working for his uncle who owned a furniture shop. He stayed with them until he met my grandmother, Nicole. They got married in 1962 and had two daughters, my aunt Sandrine and my mother, Vanina. Today, Joseph and Nicole still live in Metz. His younger sister, Sabine, lives in Metz as well, and they see each other quite often. Rose lived for most of her life in Paris and moved to the Bordeaux area a few years ago. The third sister, Lina, moved to Canada in the 1960s and have been keeping in touch with my grandfather ever since. Ida and Israel would be very proud of their children. Rose kept the promise of keeping the family together. We only have a few pictures and papers from Ida and Israel. However, through some miracle, we have Israel's prayer shawl. I wore it for my bar mitzvah, and I hope that one day my son or daughter will be wearing it as well. It is my way of keeping the memory of my great-grandparents alive. <laughs>